So more graphing today. Um, I posted some practice exams and solutions. You can expect your actual exam to be similar in content and length. Um, the exam will cover material up until what we did on class on Monday. It probably won't be very much of what we did on Monday, but definitely like the stuff, like everything up through class I, exponential growth and decay, all that kind of stuff. That is all fair game. The stuff on class J as well, there will be some graphing, but probably not so much of the shifting stuff, more of just like parabolas, circles, like we've already talked about way back in the beginning of the class, lines, and certainly so I can see those sorts of things. Um, I definitely recommend looking at the practice exams, doing the practice exams. It's certainly worth your time. It's good to know how to do things. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. So let's go ahead and so today's material won't really be on the exam. We still got to we got class. We got to cover material. So let's talk more about graphing. Um, I will. I hate to say this because it's never like the best thing to, say, but it will say of all the graphing things we talk about. The stuff we talked about today is probably the least important, in my opinion. The stretching and compressing, while it is, the real truth is, we're going to see it again when we talk about how to graph trig functions. When we talk about how to graph sine and cosine specifically, that's where it really makes more sense to talk about how they can be stretched or compressed vertically or stretched or compressed horizontally. Here, we're just kind of getting a taste of it, but it's going to come back later on when we talk about graphing sine and cosine. But so that's what we've got today. So if you missed some of what we did today, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But that's not, I'm not encouraging you to miss it. I'm just saying, like, it's less important than some other things we've done. But let's talk about what we've got here. So, just like last class, when you do something on the outside of the function, it affects it in a vertical way. You do something on the inside of the function, it affects it in a horizontal way. And typically, the horizontal thing that happens is maybe moderately counterintuitive to what you think might happen. So last time we saw that adding on the inside shifted the function to the left and subtracting on the inside shifted it to the right. In a similar way here, we're gonna see that multiplying on the inside maybe does not exactly what you think might happen. But let's look at some, let's write some words down. So um, when you multiply by a number outside of the function, we're going to get a vertical, stretch or compression. So a stretch meaning a lengthening, a compression meaning a squashing um, by a factor of A, where A is what you're multiplying by. And just to be super specific about this, if A is positive, if, actually, pardon. if A is greater than one, we get a stretch or lengthen. If A is between zero and one, we compress or squash. So for example, if A were to equal three, we would stretch that graph vertically by a factor of three. Everything would get three times as far away from the x-axis as it was. If you were to multiply by one third, we would squash it down by a factor of three. Everything would get a third closer to the x-axis than it was. And we'll see some examples here very shortly. Um, on the other side of things, if you multiply on the inside by a constant like b, that's going to be a horizontal stretch or compression. Actually, let me say a few more words before we go on here. So what I would encourage you to think about here, what we're gonna see here in a moment is, we're gonna get your, you're gonna have some function, and then you're essentially gonna multiply the Y value, so the Y value is gonna get bigger. So for example, if you did multiply by three, the same X input would give you three times as big a Y output. So you're stretching by a factor of three. On the other side here, if you were to multiply on the inside by three, that means X needs to be a third smaller so that you end up getting the same input to get the same output. So what we're gonna see here is that if you multiply on the inside, here we're by a factor of B, 
what's going to happen is if B is larger than one, we're going to compress horizontally. So if you have a big number multiplied on the inside, X needs to get smaller to account for that. And then on the flip side, if your B value is between zero and one, we're going to stretch or lengthen horizontally. So let's look at some of these examples. And I'm going to kind of, I'm going to try and draw these out kind of piece by piece. I'm going to do all the pieces. So we're going to graph f of x equal to three times the absolute value of x minus four. So here's what we're going to see. We're going to let's see if I can use some colors appropriately here. So this three is going to give us a vertical stretch by a factor of three. And then the minus four, of course, is going to shift us down by four. All right, so I'm going to start off by just drawing the parent graph. Again, you don't have to draw all the intermediate graphs. I just want to show them to you so you can see all the steps we're kind of thinking about taking here. Yeah. So first and foremost, the parent graph is y equal to the absolute value of x. So that's just going to look like y equals x to the right, y equals negative x to the left. So here's my y equal to the absolute value of x squared. And then I'm going to shift. Well, I'm not going to shift it. I'm first going to stretch it. So what I'm really doing here is all my y values are going to be three times as big as they were. In fact, let's make a little table just to kind of see here. I'm going to make a, like a table with a bunch of columns. So you can kind of really see what's happening. So you have my x values, absolute value of x values, my three times the absolute value of x values. And then lastly, we'll subtract four. So I'm just going to pick a few of x values like 0, 1, 2, and negative 1 and negative 2. So absolute value of 0 is 0. 3 times 0, still 0. On the other hand, absolute value of 1 is 1, and 3 times 1 is 3. Absolute value of 2 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. So all of my corresponding y values are 3 times as large as they were. I'm stretching by a factor of three. So I'm going to get, instead of one comma one, I'm going to get one comma three. Instead of two comma two, I'm going to get two comma six. And likewise on the left side, if I plug in negative one, the absolute value of negative one is one, and three times one is three, and the absolute value of negative two is two, and three times two is six. I'm going to get these points here, negative one, three, negative two, six. I really want you all to see. Well, in fact, let me drop before I ask you to see a thing. Ooh, excuse my ruler. I like this ruler. I'm a big fan of this little ruler. I have no idea. Maybe you do. Maybe I made it really, really clear that I love this little ruler. Okay. So, what we've done here is we have pulled these points up three times as far away from the x axis as they were. And then the last part's not terrible. No, the last part, we're just going to shift it down by four. So, every y value is going to be four or less than it was a moment ago. If I subtract by four, zero minus four is negative four. Three minus four is negative one. Six minus four is two. Three minus four is negative one. Six minus four is two. So moving all these points down by a fact by a distance of four, that point there. Is that right? Yeah, sorry. I get this point here. I get this point here. Here's my new graph, just my blue graph shifted down by four units. Now, if you were actually graphing this, you would only need to graph the last graph, right? You don't have to show me all the intermediate graphs. You're certainly welcome to if you would like to. I don't mind. I will certainly look at them. Um, you should indicate what your last graph is, but you definitely don't need to graph all of them if you don't want to. Okay, so vertical stretch just really stretches the graph. It makes it look, it kind of makes it look skinnier and taller. Right? That's what I would say a vertical stretch looks. It makes it look skinnier. But really, really, you're not making it skinnier, you're making it taller. So it's kind of one, not the other. It's not both. What I will also mention here is a vertical stretch 
often looks a lot like a horizontal compression and vice versa. A vertical squash is going to look a lot like a horizontal stretch. They have the same sort of effect. It's not always exactly the same. All right. Question so far. Okay, it's just examples, examples, examples. Let's do some more examples. Mm, this is not my favorite example. We'll talk about it anyway. So here's why this isn't my favorite example. This multiplying by one fourth on the inside. Well, first of all, we're multiplying on the inside, so we're going to affect it horizontally. And we're multiplying by a number that is less than one. So it's going to do the opposite thing we think it would. At least to me, it's the opposite. I, I would think, oh, I'm multiplying by a small number. It would make it smaller. But it's actually going to horizontally stretch it. And here's where I want you to see the thing that I'm trying to say. X needs to be bigger to account for the one-fourth we're multiplying by. Let me show you what I mean. Normally, if I was graphing good old, let's do this. If I was graphing Y equal to the square root of X, and I wanted to plot some points, I would pick easy points. So I would pick values like X equal to zero, one, four, and nine, because those are easy numbers to take the square root of. And my Y values would be the square root of zero, the square root of one, square root of four, and the square root of nine. So now let me show you a corresponding table for this new graph. And I'll graph the pair. Oh, darn, I did the thing where I, oh well, I should be careful. I always forget about the fact that my pens like to bleed through it to the other page. Let me leave this here. Sorry, okay, cool. So um, what I want to point out here is that I'm going to make a table here for my, yeah, I'm going to do this way. I'm going to have my X values, my one fourth X values, and then finally the square root of those values. Now I know in this table, I don't actually need this column. I'm not graphing that. It's not going to help me graph, but it is going to help me figure out what I need. So I still want to take the square root of nice numbers. I don't want to take, I mean, you can take the square root of three and get approximately 1.73. But the point is I'm trying to graph points that are easy for me to plot. So I'm going to pick nice values of the thing I'm taking the square root of. So I want one fourth X to be zero or one or four or nine, because those are the nice values to take the square root of. The square root of zero, still zero. The square root of one, still one. The square root of four, still two. The square root of nine, still three. The problem is those aren't my actual X values. My X values need to be a bit, well, they need to be a bit bigger. And not the first one, right? If one fourth of X is zero, then X was zero. And if one fourth times X equals one, then what was X? Four, because one fourth times four is one. Or you could just take that one and multiply it by four. Get back to this. And if one fourth of X was four, and how, that's a big number kind of for graphing anyway, how big was X? Yeah. And if one fourth of X was nine, X is gonna have to be way too big to graph 36. But the point, the point is that the X values have to be four times as large as they were to get the same Y values as just the regular square root graph. So here's my, yeah, here's my regular square root graph in black. Zero, zero, one, one, four, two, and nine, three, if you really want. And here is my, and I should label my graph. This is Y equal to the square root of X. And then here's my square root of one fourth X in red. So I'm gonna get the point zero, zero still. I'm gonna get the point four comma one instead of one comma one. I'm gonna get the point, okay, 16 comma two. I can maybe probably say that's like maybe about over here, but really it's getting kind of way over there. So it's very, very shallow. It kind of, I've almost drawn it too straight looking, right? It should still, it, right, it is curving up and up and up and up and up. Um, but I want to point out, right, what we've really done is we have stretched this horizontally. We've taken all these points on the parent graph and stretched them by a factor of four. 
or multiply them by a factor of four. Here's why this isn't my favorite example. Because this stretching by a factor of four horizontally looks exactly like squashing by a factor of two vertically. And it actually is. Because if you take the square root of one fourth x, you could simplify the square root of one fourth x as the square root of one fourth times the square root of x. And the square root of one is one, and the square root of four is. So this exactly looks like I'm multiplying on the outside by one half. So that's why I said before, a lot of the time, a horizontal stretch will look like a vertical compression and vice versa. A horizontal compression will look like a vertical stretch because sometimes they literally are the same. And that's okay. But just good to know what's happening. So I wouldn't try like making one thing turn into another thing. Like if I was facing this, I would say, okay, I'm doing something on the inside. It's horizontal. I'm multiplying by a small number on the inside. So it's going to stretch it. Instead of it. So I wouldn't try to manipulate things to make them look differently. I would just point out that sometimes doing one thing is going to look like a different thing. One second. Folks on Zoom, here's me trying to turn it So, and I guess I could say, right, you can totally see if you were to kind of shift these points downward, this point here. Um, sorry, where'd you go? This point here, four comma two, if you shift it downward, you get the point four comma one. So it is a Y value is half of what it would have been. So it really also does look like a vertical compression by a factor of two. Okay. So I don't think this putting it all together part is super duper important, but I'm gonna say it anyway. As you might've gathered from what I've said so far, I don't think a lot of what I'm saying today is very super duper important. That doesn't mean it's not important to someone else sometimes or that you're not gonna ever see it. Just that it's of all the things we talked about, it is not the most vital. But let's kind of put it all together for a second. So, all this is just saying is all the things we've seen already. So, if we let's work from the inside out, because that is usually what you want to do. So, right here, this plus C means we're going to have a horizontal shift. And I'm going to abbreviate horizontal as H O R, so I have enough room to write all the things. That's a horizontal shift, and it's going to be left. If C is positive, right, if C is negative. And then we've got this B here. Now, oh, we'll see what I mean. Um, this B here, all the inside things are horizontal. So that B is going to be a horizontal stretch or compression. Horizontal stretch, if C is less than one and bigger than zero, horizontal compression. If C is larger than one. Right, just like we saw here, right? If our C value was less than one and bigger than zero, we ended up with a horizontal stretch. Okay, we, we've dealt with the things inside the function. Now we're going to look at the outside of the function. Outside here, we have this A value gives us a vertical stretch or compression. So it's a vertical stretch. If A is larger than one, it's a vertical compression if A is between zero and one. Sounds nice. And then lastly, we have D over here. And that's going to give us, probably could have written some stuff over here. Oh, well. So that's going to give us a vertical shift up if D is positive down if D is negative. Oh, Oops, that's not that was. Well, that was weird. Okay, sorry. Brighten this up a bit. Um one thing we have well one thing we have talked about that no one's asked about is what if any of these compressing the stretching compression stretching or compressing compressing compressioning Compressing things are negative. Like what if it's a negative value? Well, last time we saw that if you multiply by a negative on the outside, you get a vertical flip. If you multiply by a negative on the inside, you get a horizontal flip or horizontal reflection. So the negatives just kind of, we kind of deal with them less. So if any of these things are negative, we're also going to have the reflections to consider. 
Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna write that down. If A happens to be negative, then we get a vertical reflection. And if B happens to be negative, we get a horizontal reflection. Now, when I graph things like this, what I'm really thinking about is I know what the parent graph looks like, and I'm kind of just trying to figure out where some important points are and then draw the graph through them. And I'm thinking about maybe it's going to stretch. Maybe, I'm really not. I'm done a lot. I'm not thinking at all about if it's going to stretch or compress. What I'm really thinking about is what the orientation of the graph is going to be. Is it going to be reflected in some way? So what's the parent graph look like? Is it going in the usual direction or have I flipped it around some way? And then maybe find a point or two that it goes through to try and graph it. I am really not thinking about stretching or compressing. Perfectly frank. It doesn't mean we can't consider it though. So let's look at some more examples. And I'll try and actually talk about it in the realistic way that I would actually graph it, not this liar way of pretending like we do the thing that we don't really ever do. Maybe there are some people that do it that way. It's not me. Okay, so let's look at this next one. I want to graph the negative square root of 2x minus 3. So when I'm looking at this, here's what I'm really thinking about. I see a square root function. Great, I know that opens up into the right. So I see a square root. And I'm thinking, boom, this thing. You can't see it all. There you go, I'm thinking that. The two, I don't care. I know, okay, the two, I'm very horizontal compression. Okay, big deal. So we know we're going to, I should write down the things. So we're going to get a horizontal compression from that too. But I'm really not caring about that. I do care about that negative sign. I know that negative sign outside of the function is going to flip me which way? Ooh, which way? Vertical, horizontal. Yeah, vertical, because it's outside, right? Vertical things happen outside. Horizontal things happen inside. So it's a reflection across the x axis if you want to be all mathy about your words. Reflection across the x axis. And then lastly, we have this shift by three, and it's going to be a shift that is down three. This pen, I want this pen to be great. It's just kind of okay. It doesn't write quite as nicely. Not as, okay. So. I'm really thinking about, great, my square root did that. And then this negative thing is going to flip it over. So our flip is going to get us something that looks vaguely like this. And then our down three is gonna shift it down by three. So what I really, 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 really am thinking about is what's gonna to happen to the origin. Because I know that for my usual square root graph, I started at the point zero, zero. And then if I flip over, it doesn't change where that goes. Right, zero, zero flipped over is still zero, zero. And then I guess I should talk about compressing it horizontally doesn't change where it goes either. So I kind of ignore it. And then I'm shifting down three. So I'm really thinking about starting here and then going down into the right. But really, I would like to maybe have another point to go through. I don't want to just like guess what's happening here. So I might pick a nice value of X to plug in. What's a nice what's a nice value that x could be aside from zero because we've already used zero? Anybody, anybody, just yell it out. Yeah, two is a great choice. So if I start maybe trying to plot a couple points to make this graph look like something, if x is two, y is going to be the negative square root of four minus three, which is negative two minus three, which is negative five. So great, when I plugged in x equal to two, I got y equal to negative five. Now, I will point out there is a smaller value of x that is also nice. It's not as nice. It's not an integer, though. It's a fraction. I could also pick x equal to 1 half. So if I pick x equal to 1 half, I get 2 times 1 half in the square root, which is just 1. So I have negative square root of 1 minus 3, which is negative 1 minus 3, which is negative 4. So I've got this point right here, negative 1 half comma negative 4. So notice, because I do think it's worth noticing, 
my x values that I usually would pick, which would be 0, 1, 2, sorry, not 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, what's the next one I usually pick for square root? 0, 1, 4, have all got cut in half. Zero, half of 0 is 0, half of 4 is 2, half of 1 is a half. And the next one I would usually pick would be 9. I'll pick 9 over 2 instead. If I plug in 9 over 2, 9 over 2 times 2 is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. So I'm getting the negative square root of 9 minus 3, which is negative 3 minus 3, which is negative 6. If I plug in 9 halves or 4 and a half, I get negative 6. And then I feel confident enough that, okay, I've got a pretty good idea of what this is going to look like. It's not like that usual square root thing, but it's been modified a bit. It has been horizontally compressed. Where my X values are half as big as they usually would have been. And, my, and then it's gotten flipped and shifted down by three. Just to kind of point out, let me show you a couple things. Here's what the original parent graph would have looked like. So here's my parent graph, usual 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. And what I really care about showing you, even though I you know I've professed a lot that I don't, is let me show you what the compression looks like. So if we have y equal to the square root of 2x, all my x values are half as big as they would have been. So instead of getting 1, 1, I get 1 half 1. Instead of getting 4, 2, I get 2, 2. Instead of getting nine, three, I get four and a half comma three. Got the same sort of shape, but it's been swooshed inward towards the y-axis. And then we flipped it over and shifted it down. I don't know what it. So I feel like I'm giving some mixed messages here because it's kind of a mixed message to do. Graphing is really, it's really kind of a free for all in a lot of ways, right? People have so many different ways of going about doing things. As long as you can make a relatively decent looking graph and you've got the features that are important, like some intercepts and maybe some asymptotes, when we start talking about asymptotes, you're good to go. As long as you can make your graph look reasonably good and you've got the quote unquote important points, which really vary, right? For a, for a parabola, it's the intercepts and the vertex. For the square root graph, it's kind of this first point here and then make sure the shape is right. For a circle, it's the center, which actually isn't part of the graph, and then maybe the four points around the circle that we usually plot. So there's a lot of different things we do. For a line, it's definitely the X and the Y intercept. So it kind of takes some getting used to of what do we need to graph for this particular thing. It varies depending on what the graph looks like. So let's look at this next one. Okay, so looking at negative one over x minus four squared. First, I'm going to think about what the parent graph is. And the parent graph here is one over x squared. So the minus four is going to shift us left or right? Yeah, oh, left, right? That's it, right? That's, that's my left. Right, to the right, obviously. Yeah, maybe not obviously, but it is to the right. So that's going to shift us to the right by four. So here's, and I'm going to graph all the graphs. So when I graph one over x squared, like just the parent graph, the things I think about that are important, there aren't really any intercepts. Like literally, they're not any intercepts. Um, there is a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote, and they're both at zero until we start shifting things around. So the only points I really think about plotting for this graph are the points one comma one, because if x is one, y is one, and negative one comma one. If x is negative one, y is also one. And then I've got, ver and maybe I also kind of pretend to think about plotting, but ooh, it's, it's not my favorite. If x is one half, y is going to be four. If x is two, y is going to be one fourth ish. Don't love that, to be honest. So I try to graph it reasonably well. And then the same on the other side. All these numbers here are in my way. Okay. So there's my one over x squared graph. 
making sure I hit the points one, one, and negative one, one. And then I'm going to do what the shifts tell me to do. So this is definitely one where I do pay more attention to kind of just what my transformations are. So I shift right by four. So if I graph y equal to one over x minus four squared, I'm just moving everything to the right four. Specifically, these two points and the vertical asymptote. So instead of the vertical asymptote being at zero, or x equal to zero, I should say, now the vertical asymptote is going to live at x equal to four. And vertical asymptotes should always be indicated unless they're one of the axes by a dashed line. So here's my vertical asymptote x equals four. I'm not going to draw it on the y-axis because the y-axis is kind of in the way. So we don't usually draw a vertical asymptote on an x or a y-axis. Um, and then I also know that this point, negative one, one, is going to move four to the right to be positive three, one. And this point, one, one, is going to move four to the right to be five, one. And then it's going to look the same, just shift it over. Like this. Notably, maybe not notably, but you can see that this graph is going to have a y-intercept, but we're not actually done with the graphing, right? That's not our final graph, so I shouldn't bother finding the y-intercept right now. Although you could, it would be 1 over 16 if you plug in 0 for x. Finally, the negative on the outside, that's going to give us a, I should, I shouldn't, I gave it away already. That negative is on the outside, right? It's not, right? We're not doing it before we like doing the squaring or anything else. So that negative is on the outside. It's going to give us a vertical flip. So we're going to flip over. We're going to get this thing just literally take it, turn it over like that. Oh, I forgot about my cool idea. About Someday I'll, make, I'll follow through on that idea. If you weren't here last time, you missed it. It's okay. I had the idea of using like transparencies like back from when I was in high school and you know, actually taking a graph and flipping it over so you could see the thing. I think so. still things like a good idea. So there's basically what the graph looks like. And yeah, there's a wire intercept there. It's not super important, but I'm going to label it anyway. The wire intercept, if I just set x equal to zero, I'm going to get y equal to negative one over zero minus four squared, which is negative one over positive 16. So that's the point right there. Zero comma negative one sixteen. Try and keep things in order here. Try and fail. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. So mostly, that's what we're doing. Um, it can get Let's do another back page over here. Wow. I'm going to have to come up with some more examples over here. So let's look at this last page of the notes, and then maybe I'll come up with some more examples. So there is one thing I do want to make you very aware of, and that's this one here. This f of x equal to one third times x minus one minus four. So we definitely have shifts in both vertical and horizontal direction. How much are we shifting up or down? Down by four. Okay, uh, here's a trick question. Watch, I'm just gonna tell you. If I ask you how much we were shifting left or right, the answer would be to the which direction? To the right. And the answer would not be one. We are not shifting one to the right, which seems a little confusing, I will admit. So here's the deal. The reason we're not shifting one to the right is because before you can think about your shift to the right or to the left, your horizontal shift, you have to kind of take into account the horizontal compression that's happening. Or sorry, the horizontal stretch. Apologies, that's a horizontal stretch, not a compression because we're multiplying by a small number. So if you look back for a second to the page with all the things on it, why can't it be like a reach? That's not a very good description. To this page here, you might notice that this horizontal stretch or compression factor is factored out from the x plus or minus whatever that number is there. And so if we have both a horizontal stretch or compression and a horizontal shift, it's kind of up to us to make sure that we do that factoring before we start to say more things out. So what I mean here is I'm going to rewrite this as the absolute value of one third 
times x minus what? Minus four. What's gonna go right there? What's one divided by one third? If you think about it, if you, if, if you multiply it back through, one third times x is one third x, and one third times minus three is minus one. So we definitely do get the same thing here. So this is more indicative of the fact that we have a shift to the right by three, a horizontal compression. I keep saying the wrong thing. Horizontal stretch. by a factor of three. And lastly, a shift down by a four. And I got plenty of time. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm trying to think about how I wanna do this. I'm just gonna draw all the things. So first let's do the, what do I wanna do first here? Let me think about what I'm doing here. Yeah, okay, interesting. You can kind of go either way. You can kind of do the shift first. I should say you can do the horizontal shift first, or you can do the horizontal stretch first. It kind of doesn't matter which one you do first. I say before I look at my book, no, it doesn't really matter. You can do either one, yeah. Um. So let's think about our parent graph here. Our parent graph is y equal to the opposite value of x. So I'm gonna take that, and I'm just going to draw the, some terrible, crappy looking graphs up here because I don't really want, I want to kind of show you the thought process about actually having to draw the thing. So here's my parent, my really absolute value of x. I've maybe look, made it look a little too vertical, but that's okay. And then I'm going to shift it to the right three. So I'm going to move it over you know, one, two, three, like that. So now here's my new graph, shift it over to the right by three. And then I'm going to multiply it on the inside by one third, which is going to give me a vertical, sorry, a horizontal stretch, right? Because I am making, I'm having to make the X values three times as big as they were to get the same corresponding Y values. Let me actually, yeah, let me give you an example. So now I'm going to stretch this out and be like, okay, instead of this, I'm going to get this. I'm giving it a horizontal stretch. Oops, I don't need an absolute value there, sorry, in parentheses. So here's what I mean by this. So here, for example, if, if X equals five, Y is gonna equal the absolute value of five minus three, which is two. Here, the X minus three thing has to be three times as big as it was to get the same Y value of two. So I need this to not be two anymore. I need this to be six. So what I need is for X minus three to equal six or for X to equal nine. So X has to be a lot bigger so that Y ends up having the same Y value. Because if X is nine, nine minus three is six, one third times, I should just write it. Y is gonna equal one third times nine minus three, which is one third times six, which is two. Now you might be thinking, James said it was gonna be three times as big, but it's not. It's only like not even twice as big. And the reason that's true is because there's a shift and a stretch here. So what's really happening is if you take away the shift of three first, so if you shift X and equal to five and X will nine back by three, so back to X equals two and back to X equals six, then they are a multiple of three away from each other. That's why they don't look exactly like multiples of three, but there's a shift and a stretch here. In any event, we can kind of now see what the graph is gonna look like. So the, oh, I should say this word, the vertex of this absolute value graph, because absolute value graphs also have a vertex, the bottom of the V, or I guess the top, 
right? So this is the kind of the actually the only other kind of graph that we've really talked about having these vertex. Parabolas have vertexes, vertices, vertexes, whatever you want to call them, and absolute value graphs also have vertexes. The bottom of the V, or if it's flipped over, the top of the upside down V. So my vertex has moved over from the point zero zero where it usually starts. I've shifted it three to the right. I've stretched it by a factor of three, but that doesn't change anything. And then I'm going to shift it down by one, two, three, four. So that point there, three comma negative four is the bottom of my upward opening absolute value graph. And it's gonna be way, way kind of wide, right? Because it's getting really, really horizontally stretched. So it's gonna look like, let's see, let me, so again, I know it's supposed to look really wide, but the easiest thing for, for me to actually make it look kind of decent is to pick another value of X that you need to deal with. So I've plugged in the point three for X and I've gotten one third times zero, which is zero minus four. What's the next, biggest value of x you can plug in that's going to be easy to after I subtract three multiply by one third six if I plug in six six minus three is three one third times three is one absolute value of one is still one one minus four is negative three so I've gone over to six with a value of negative three and then I can say well it's going to look like that and then whoops sorry it should look Kind of the same to the other side. You could go three to the left if you wanted to. You could pick x equal to zero, and then zero minus three is negative three, and one third times negative three is negative one, and the absolute value of negative one is positive one, and one minus four is still negative three. So you've got that point there. So what you can kind of do for an absolute value graph, if you're trying to actually graph and make it look decent, is find the vertex, and then find one point to the right and one point to the left, and then after you find one point to the right and one point to the left. It's just going to be straight lines through those points. That's how I typically think about graphing an absolute value. Trying to make it look decently. Just straight lines. Okay. And usually we draw them kind of the same length, so it doesn't look like lopsided, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I should point out there is definitely a y intercept here of zero, negative three. And there are actually two x intercepts. If you kept going to the right, you would eventually hit the x axis. To the right, you'd eventually hit the x axis. And to the left, you'd eventually hit the x axis. Sometimes people ask you to find those. So actually, yeah, we got enough time. If I wanted to find my x intercepts, well, again, I'll remind you we always find x intercepts by setting y equal to zero because you're on the x axis. On the x axis, y has to be zero. You have no other choice. So if we set y equal to zero, we're going to be solving the absolute value of one third x minus one minus four equal to zero. I know we haven't really talked about this, but whenever you solve an absolute value equation, you always want to isolate the absolute value thing. So you have the absolute value of one third times x minus one equal to positive four. So if I take the absolute value of four, I get four. So the if I want the inside to be equal four, or I want the inside to be equal negative four, because the absolute value of negative four is also equal to four. So what we do is we just set the insides equal to the one third x minus one equals four, or let me solve this one first. So you get one third x equal to five, you get x equal to 15, or one third x minus one equals negative four, you get one, I know I'm running out of room here, one third x equal to negative four plus one is negative three, excuse me, x equal to negative nine. So those would be your x intercepts, which are way kind of off chart. Now, if you look at my graph here to the left, I didn't quite draw this line perfectly because it definitely looks like it was going to hit this axis before you get to negative nine. That's okay. It doesn't have to look well. And this is also a good maybe argument for not drawing your graphs on perfectly lined graph paper. Because if I was drawing this on my own, what I would really do is say, I don't need graph paper. I'm just going to use regular paper. And I'm going to say, can I have, do I have, I know I have regular paper in here. If I wanted to graph this with kind of all the important details that I think are worthwhile, I would do this. So it's okay, here's my thing. I'm at the point three, negative four, which is about right there. And then I'm going up and to the right. Sure. Up and to the left. 
for that point is negative nine zero. That point is 15 zero. And that point is zero negative three. That's how I would really like to graph this y equal to the opposite value of one third x minus one minus four. So again, taking into account the shape of the thing, the important point, the vertex of it, and the intercepts, which are also moderately important. That's really what I'm thinking about when I'm trying to graph something like this. Okay. One more graph. Ah, the, my least favorite graph. Okay, I can do it. It's all right. I can make it work. Uh, we're graphing uh, one half times x minus two to the third. So I know what my parent graph looks like. I'm just disappointed by it. So my parent graph is the ever challenging. I, try, I feel like I, I should stop. I'm going to give you a complex about it. It's not terrible to graph at all. It's perfectly fine. Y equals X cubed. I'm sure you can all handle it, just like I can handle it. So here's my parent graph. And when I graph this graph, I always want to hit the points 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1. And then I usually also throw on a 2, 8, and a negative 2, negative 8. Again, here's a prime example of a graph where I would really rather not have this grid system here and just be able to kind of be a little bit more loosey-goosey about it so that I don't have to like make it look nice. But since I do, I will. And go this way. And I will point out as you as you graph this graph many times, what you should be aware of is at the origin or wherever the origin moves to, the graph does get very, very horizontal for just a split second. So it flattens out and then it unflattens out. That is the usual shape of this cubic graph. What are we doing again? Okay. So X minus two cubed is going to shift it two to the right. Yeah, that's not so bad. I'm just moving everything two to the right. So instead of zero, zero, I get two, zero. Instead of negative one, negative one, I get positive one, negative one. Instead of one, one, I get three, one. And then I guess instead of two, eight, I get four, eight. Instead of negative two, negative eight, I get zero, negative eight. So there's my same five points, just all moved over two to the right. We'll do our best to graph this one. That's pretty good. I do say so myself, which I guess I do. And, but it really does look like you've just taken the whole graph and just like went, put it over two to the right. And now for the somewhat harder part, now we have a multiplication by one half on the outside, which means we're going to have a vertical or horizontal thing. Vertical one is it going to be a stretch or a compression. Are we stretching it out, making the y value, are we making the y values bigger, or are we making the y values smaller than multiplying by one half? We can make them small. So it's kind of so it's it's the here's the thing. It's actually opposite for x and y. If you multiply the x by a one half. The X had to get bigger to undo the multiplication of one half because the X is the thing you input. Whereas if you're doing something that affects it vertically, you're affecting the Y value. And the Y value is what you get after you've done everything else. So if I do X minus two cubed, right, I move everything two to the right. And then the multiplying by one half makes all the resultant Y values smaller by a factor of two. For example, for this red graph, if I plug in X equal to four, I get four minus two cubed, which is two cubed, which is eight. But then if I multiply it by one half, one half times eight is gonna give me a four. So all my y values are getting squashed down by a factor of two. So if I write my final graph here, one half times x minus two cubed, we're going to compress vertically. So all my y values are half of what they were. So instead of four comma eight, I get four comma four. Instead of three comma one, I get three comma one half. Instead of two comma zero, I still get two comma zero. Because a y value of zero, half of zero is still zero. And then essentially you're moving towards the x-axis. You're squashing everything above down and below up. So then I get a instead of negative, sorry, instead of one negative one, I get one negative one half. Instead of zero negative eight, I get zero negative four. 
Okay, so here's my new graph. Wish me luck. It's kind of hard to tell, but it really is getting squashed down. Again, I would really, really encourage you all to maybe graph things like this on Desmos, like so you can get a better look at them. Because although my graphs are pretty okay today, you can get a better look at them if you graph them on something that is precise. All right, 10.50, stop talking. I have office hours over in C class.